Good morning. It is great to see each of you here this morning. I know with an extra hour of sleep last night, you are ready to worship God this morning. What an awesome opportunity it is that we have every first day of the week to gather together as Christians, as saints, as those of a like precious faith and like precious mind to be able to worship our God in heaven above. And I hope that you are thankful for this opportunity that we have this morning. I'm so grateful for the opportunity that the elders have presented me to uh, work in this full-time role as the minister of this congregation. I'm excited for this opportunity. I hope that you are excited as well, and I'm just looking forward uh, to perhaps growth and maybe um, good changes that will come um, from our relationship working together with one another, and I hope that you're excited. I know that I am, and I'm just so thankful. I count myself blessed and honored. Uh, to be able to be here this morning. We have several visitors in our midst. I'm grateful for you, and you are our honored guest, and obviously we invite you back at any opportunity that you have. If you have any questions, uh, please don't leave this building this, this morning with those questions unanswered. Please find somebody, and we will be certainly happy to talk to you and try to answer those questions if you have any of those questions. I'm swapping a PowerPoint this morning, um, so I'm, I'm a creature of habit. And so swapping to something like PowerPoint, I count myself kind of a, a techie kind of guy. I like technology, but swapping to PowerPoint is something that scares me out of my mind. So if, if this doesn't work out, don't worry. We won't keep doing it, but we'll see, uh, see if we can continue on uh, in, in this way. I do want to mention this, though, as we begin. With me being the minister here at this congregation, I want you to know that I want what's best for you. I truly want you to succeed in this life. I want you to have the best physical life that you can possibly have. But obviously, most of all, I want you to have the best spiritual life that you can have. And I want you to know that as your minister, I'm going to be someone who is going to serve you to the best of my ability. I'm going to be someone who is going to make myself as available as I can to you. And whatever way that you need help and whatever way that you need someone to be there for you, I want you to know that you can come to me and you can talk to me. And that I'm going to be there to try and help you. But I'm also going to be someone who is, going, who is going to try to push you to grow. I want you to be someone who is continually looking for an opportunity to better yourself as a Christian. To better yourself as someone who can count yourself, someone who is a soldier for Almighty God. Someone who is fighting on his, on his side, on his team. And I want you to know that I'm someone who's going to be there to push you to do that. But I also want you to know this, that I want you to be someone who's going to push me to do that as well. I want you to know that I understand that I'm only 24 years old. There is a lot that I have to learn, a lot in ministry that I have not yet experienced, but I want you to know that I'm someone who is willing to grow, I want to grow, and I want us to grow together in our relationship. And I want you to know that I'm here for you and I'm going to do all that I can to help you succeed and to help you grow as a Christian. As we begin this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer and then we'll dive right into our study this morning. Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we're so grateful unto thee for this day that thou hast blessed us with. So thankful for the opportunity that we have on this first day of the week to gather together as Christians and as saints, as thy people this morning to worship thee. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have presented before us to be able to work together. We're thankful for the relationships that we're able to enjoy with one another as brothers and sisters and as fellow comrades in this life who are fighting for that end goal and that end goal being heaven. Father, we pray that as we go forward from this place, from this time, and to the coming weeks, months, and years, that we would do all that we can to help each other succeed. That we would do all that we can to push each other to be the best that we can be, to grow into who Thou would want us to be. And Father, we pray that we would be there for one another, encourage one another, edify, lift up one another. And Father, we pray that we would do so to the best of our ability. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ. We're thankful for His life on this earth, for what He has done for us. And Father, ultimately for the sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. Father, we pray that every single day we can live our lives and exemplify our faith in Him, and that we would imitate Him in everything that we do. Father, we pray all these things in His precious name. Amen. I want to talk this morning, this idea about what is Christian living. You know, I think about us as Christians today, and you guys are probably thinking, why are you walking over here? I feel like I've neglected you guys a little bit, so I'm going to try to swap it up a little bit. We talk about this idea of Christian living. What is Christian living? You know, when I think about you and I today as Christians, I think about passages like Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul talks about how we are supposed to be different from this world. We're not supposed to conform to this world, but rather we are to transform ourselves to be the best that we can be for Him. I think about passages like 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, where he talks about how we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. We've been called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We are called to be different. 
I think about passages like Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, where the Hebrews writer there talks about how the people, those great heroes of faith we had just read about, how they are all strangers. They're pilgrims in this land, understanding that they don't belong in this world. And you and I understand, we think, I think about the song that we sometimes sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We understand that we don't belong in this world. We don't belong here on this earth. And yet, while we're here in this world, how do we live our lives? How can we live a life that is pleasing to God and that is acceptable to Him? How do we live a life that is Christ-like? What is Christian living? Over the course of the next nine weeks, I want to embark upon a study, a journey with you as we walk through 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want to look at what we oftentimes call the Christian graces. And I want to look at these things, and each week we're going to look at a different one. All we're going to do this morning is do a little bit of introductory work, some background, some context, just kind of lay the groundwork, the foundation as to where we're going to go in this study. And that's all we'll do this morning. But then I want to go um, each uh, grace by grace, I guess, if you will, and talk about how we need to be individuals who are adding these things into our lives as we go through to make ourselves the best that we can be. And then in week number nine, I want to kind of wrap everything together. And I want to talk about why. I want to talk about why this study is so important. Why do we need to look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and apply these things to our lives? I hope that this is something that will be beneficial to you. I hope that it is something that you will consider yourself uh, blessed to be able to be a part of and that you'll be able to grow. As we jump into this study, I want to look at a little bit of background, though. You know me, you know I like background, I like context. Before we dive into a passage, you can't just take one verse and pull it out and think that you can use it however you want. You've got to look at context and you've got to look at background. Number one, though, I want us, before we get into that, I want to look at this idea of some building blocks. Number one, I want you to know that this is a process. When you look at each of these Christian graces, when you look at each of these things that we're going to study, I want you to understand that this is something that is a process. You and I know that you can't go to sleep tonight and then tomorrow wake up and bam, you're going to have every single thing already added into your life. You and I understand that living the life of a Christian is a time for us to grow. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 talks about how we are to take the sincere milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. We are going to be individuals who are going to try to push ourselves. That's why I mentioned that this morning before we even began. We are going to be here for each other to help push each other to grow to be the best that we can be. But understand this is a process. This is something that is going to take time, but it's something that certainly can be done if you put in the effort and the work and the diligence. Number two, I want you to also notice this, that each of these characteristics in some sense builds upon one another. Each of these things is going to help grow and mesh with one another. You can't have one of these things and then look at the others and say, I don't want those. They are all going to complement each other. And I think so many people do that when it comes to Christianity. They think that you can pick and choose certain things in Christianity and you can just take the other things that you don't want and shove them out of your life. That's not how Christianity works. You're either all in or you're all out. And that's what we're going to talk about as we go through this. But each characteristic is something that builds upon one another. It is going to help you grow to be the best that you can be. Number three, I want you to think about this. I want you to know that you always have God on your side. As someone who is a faithful Christian, as someone who is living your life in a righteous way for Him, know that God is always on your side. Know that you can go to the Creator, the One who sustains us in this life, the One who created you. You can go to Him for help. You can ask Him for help. 1 John 5 and verse 14 talks about the confidence that we can have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He's going to what? He's going to hear us. Brothers and sisters, we can ask Him for help. We can go to Him for help. And He's going to be there to help us through this, this process. But then number four, I want you to look, at, look around this room. I want you to think about the individuals that are sitting here with you. And I want you to understand that this is a family. I want you to understand that every single person in this audience is part of a family here at East Hill. We are all a part of the same team. We are all a part of the same army, the same, uh, the same team that is striving for that same goal. Within this family, there ought to be no strife. There ought to be no division, but rather unity is something that we should always strive for every single day. If there is any kind of negativity, any kind of hypocrisy, any kind uh, of, of anything that will bring us down, any strife or division, I beg you, squash it out. I beg you to push it out of your life. Don't be someone who allows that to come into your heart because when you do, the devil knows that and he's going to exploit that 
and he's going to try to bring down the church as he does this. Let's get into some background as we go through this study. I want you to look, think about who wrote the book of 2 Peter. Who wrote the book of 2 Peter? I think it's pretty obvious. We know that Simon Peter is the one who wrote this book. But I want to talk a little bit about Peter for just a moment because Peter's an interesting character study. And as I've been kind of planning lessons uh, about what to speak, I, I've obviously got a lot more opportunities to preach now, so there's all kinds of places we could go, and maybe some character studies is something that we'll do as we go forward. But I think about Peter, we know that his name was actually not Peter. His name was actually Simon. If you go to John chapter 1 and verse 42, Jesus is actually the very first one to call him Peter, and actually he doesn't even call him Peter. He calls him Cephas. Now Cephas, though, in the Greek language is translated to the word Petros, and Petros is then translated to the word Peter. Therefore, he is called Peter. That is just what we know him by, and that is what we call him. We know that his name was, uh, that his home was in Capernaum. That's where he grew up. You look at Mark chapter 1, you could go back all the way to verse 21, but that you could also look at verse 29, and he talks about how that was where his home was. That was where he grew up. We know that he was a fisherman by trade. We understand that that was his job. That was his occupation. That was how he made his money. But here's the interesting thing that I want to mention. When you look um, at Matthew chapter 4, One of the interesting things there, as mentioned with Peter, is also his brother Andrew. Now, Andrew is a very, very interesting study because not a lot is known about Andrew. In fact, Andrew is probably one of the least known apostles out of all the apostles. And yet, this is so very interesting. If you were to study Andrew, you know that his name pops up twice in the Bible, two to two different times. He's mentioned, his name is mentioned, but the work of Andrew is only mentioned twice in the Bible. And both of those times, Andrew is known for bringing somebody to Jesus Christ. Both of those occasions that he's recorded about, he is bringing somebody else to Jesus Christ. I hope that you and I could say that out of the lives that we live, if nobody remembered anything else about your life but one thing, it was that you were just like Andrew and that you were always bringing somebody else to Jesus Christ. We know that Peter was married. Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 15 talks about how Jesus went in to heal his mother in law. And we know that this is significant because what do Roman Catholics think? Roman Catholics think that Peter was the first Roman pope. But what's interesting about popes is popes can't be what? Popes can't be married. But yet, Peter obviously was married because Jesus went in to heal his mother in law. And so it disqualifies him from being that, thus showing contradictions in their belief. We also know that he was an elder in the Lord's church, Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, among other places. We understood he took the role of being, uh, of being an elder, very important, and he saw the importance of the organization of the church. But specifically in our text, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you there. Specifically in our text there, you look there at verse 1, what is he called? He's called a bond servant. I think the King James calls him a servant. And I think this is so very important because Peter knew exactly what it meant to serve because he was a servant. He was someone who put his life out there to serve other people. In fact, when you look at the life that he lived, who was he always around? He was always around Jesus. Jesus, the greatest servant that you and I could ever have or know in this life. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, the Bible says that Jesus came into this world not to be served, but to do what? To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I think about us in our world today. How so many times we try to do things that are going to just push our lives out in front of everybody else. A lot of times people, we look at our name and we just, we want all these letters by our name, don't we? We want MD or CEO or PhD or some kind of degree by our name. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want that by your name, that's great. If you've worked hard for it, that's fantastic. I'm glad that you have. But brothers and sisters, the greatest title that anybody could ever put by their name is that of a servant. The greatest thing that you could ever be considered to be, the greatest thing that you could ever consider yourself to be, is that of a servant. But Peter also, um, he also counts himself what? As an apostle. Now, I bring this up because I think this is interesting, because there are a lot of people in our religious world today who think that they are apostles. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, it's interesting because we ask the question, who can be an apostle? Well, only specific groups of people can be an an apostle. There had to be qualifications that were met. If you go to Acts chapter 1, you look at verses 21 through 26, it talks about all of the qualifications that have to be met. There's three of them, thus signifying and showing that not just anybody can be an apostle. An apostle had to be someone who, number one, was with Jesus during his earthly ministry. He had to be someone who was with Jesus at the time he was baptized, and then he had to go all the way with him through his entire ministry. 
But he also had to be someone who was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. He had to see Jesus after he had been resurrected and see him walking and standing and talking. But then he also had to be someone who was appointed by Jesus himself. So I guess we could ask the question, can anybody just be an apostle? Well, the answer is no, because not everybody was back alive at that time. In fact, nobody was. Therefore, nobody today can be an apostle. Who was he speaking to, though? Who was his audience as he writes this book? I want you to think about this. And I bring this up because I think this is very important as well. We know that he's talking to Christians because he talks about there in verse 2, or actually in verse 1, he talks about those of a like precious faith. And I think that's so important because when you think about who he was writing to, he was writing to two groups of people, right? Jews and the Gentiles. Now, what's the big deal there? We know Jews and Gentiles didn't get along because the Jews were individuals who thought that they were the only ones who should have access to salvation. They thought that the Gentiles should not have salvation and they hated them for it, so much so to where when you look at passages like Acts chapter 13, you look at verse 44, the Bible says, on the next Sabbath, notice this, almost the whole city came together to hear the Word of God. But then verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes... They were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Two things I want to point out from this passage of Scripture. Number one, notice the Jews' response. The Jews respond to the Gentiles coming into their midst to hear the Gospel. How do they act towards them? They're filled with envy. They're filled with hatred. Can you imagine sitting in these pews and somebody walking through our doors who maybe looks different from you, who maybe has a different background from you, who maybe has a different job from you, somebody who is different from you, and then you look at them and you say, you don't deserve the Gospel. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine looking at somebody around you and saying, you don't deserve the Gospel, but I do. That's what the Jews were doing. That's why it's so significant that Peter is writing to Christians in general, not just to the Jews, but to every single person. But then number two, notice what it does to them as they're listening. Look at the very last thing that the the verse says. They oppose the things spoken by Paul. They were allowing their hatred and their envy to blind themselves from hearing what the Apostle Paul was speaking. That's how bad it had gotten for them. They they hated the people that were there, and they hated them so much to where it blinded them from seeing and hearing the things that Paul was speaking. Brothers and sisters, we know that the Gospel is for every single person. Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. It's the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes for who? To the Jew first, but then also to who? To the Greek, the Gospel is for every single person. And brothers and sisters, how dare we be someone who thinks that there is someone out there in our world today who is unworthy of hearing the Gospel of Jesus Christ because that is not the case. I want to notice the time period of when this book was written. And this is also important, I think, because of this. It was written around 65 A.D., but that's significant because if you go one year before to 64 A.D., what happened to the city of Rome? The city of Rome burned down in AD 64, and this is important because Emperor Nero was the one who was reigning at that time. When that city burned, what did Emperor Nero do? He blamed it on the Christians, thus heightening all of the persecution that the Christians were facing. The Christians were facing a very difficult time at the time of this writing, which is why he talks there at the end of verse 4, and we're going to get to this in just a moment, but he talks there at the end of verse 4, about the promises, that precious promise that we're going to receive. That's why it's so important. They were going through a difficult time. The persecution was there. And yet he says there's something to which you can look forward. I want to move through verse 1, and I want to, I want to look at this, this idea of a precious faith for just a moment. And I want to go to a couple of passages with you. And you're probably thinking that's more than just a couple, Caleb. It is. But we're going to get through these very, very quickly. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 1. And I want to look at some of these passages because it talks about this idea of faith. And I think faith, obviously we know faith, is so very important for us as individuals, as Christians, as children of God. But I want to point this out as we go forward through through, uh, some of these passages. Galatians chapter 1, look with me here at verse 23. The Bible says, But they were hearing only, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches, look at this, the faith which He once tried to destroy. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Look with me here at verse 27. Paul says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the Gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or an absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the Gospel. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, look with me here, beginning in verse 2. 
1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. To Timothy, Paul says, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at chapter 4. The first Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from, look at this, the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines and demons. Look at chapter 5. Look at verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Look at chapter 6, one page over. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from, look at this, the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Drop down to verse 21. By professing it, some have strayed concerning, look at this, the faith. Grace, peace, grace be with you. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning, look at this, the faith. One last verse. Go to the end. Go towards the end of the Bible. Look at the book of Jude. And I want you to look at verse 3. Jude verse 3. The writer says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all of the saints. You and I understand, and I want you to look at, I want you to notice this, how he talks about this. We understand that there is no other faith that you and I can have in order to be successful and faithful Christians because what is the one word that came before the word faith in every single one of these passages? It's the word the. I want you to notice he talks about the faith. There is nothing else that you and I could ever turn to in this religious world other than the faith that we can have in the Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter knew that better than anybody else because you remember his great confession? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, what did he say? He said, Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, or rather Peter, knew exactly what it meant to have a faith, to have the faith in the Christ, the Son of the living God. He understood you couldn't go anywhere else. And brothers and sisters, that's what he tells them here. He talks about this precious faith that you and I can have. But as he continues to talk about faith, I want you to also notice that he transitions and begins to talk about this idea of righteousness. I want you to read this quote here on the screen behind me. I want you to notice what it says. This is from one of the commentaries I was reading uh, last week. It says, The righteousness of God, of course, is the foundation of the entire universe. The righteousness of God is the foundation of the entire universe. When I think about the righteousness of God, I think it to be synonymous with talking about the justice of God. You and I understand that God is perfect. We know that God is pure, that He is holy, that He is just, that there is nothing wicked or evil within Almighty God, that God has always done right. And thus, without God and without His righteousness, you and I know that we would have access to absolutely nothing. Without the righteousness of God, you and I would not be able to be where we are today. Without the righteousness of God, we couldn't come together and worship Him in spirit and in truth. And yet, God in His infinite wisdom saw that. And so He laid out that pattern for us and He allowed us access to His righteousness. Look, we all know Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And we referenced it just a moment ago. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. It's the power of God. Um, and it's for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And we put so much emphasis on that verse. And that's great because we need to. That verse is so important. But oftentimes, we stop right there. What about verse 17? Well, in verse 17, the Apostle Paul continues his thought. He says, for in it... What's the it? What is he talking about? Brothers and sisters, he's talking about the Gospel. For in it, the Gospel, the righteousness of God, is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just will live by faith. Having an understanding of the Gospel leads you to having an understanding and an appreciation of the righteousness of God, of what He has done, and what He continues to do for us. But not only His righteousness, as you continue on through our text, He also talks about His grace and His peace. You know, when I think about the word grace, I think about something that you and I will never ever deserve. Something that you and I are totally undeserving of. Something that God has given to you and I at the expense of Jesus Christ. In fact, when you look at the word grace, you can make an acronym out of it. G-R-A-C-E. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. 
When I go to Romans chapter 5, and I look through that passage there in verses 6 through 11, I think about the love that God has for us. And obviously, that's what he talks about there, specifically in verse 8. But you and I know that when I look at that passage, I can't help but think about the grace of God. How you and I were still sinners, yet God still sent His Son for us. You and I were undeserving of the sacrifice of Jesus, and yet what did God do? God sent His Son to this earth to live, to give us that example, and then ultimately to die for us. And within that is the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, we didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. We never will deserve it. And yet we still have it, don't we? I think about the word peace. I think peace is something that is kind of lost on our world today, especially after the last couple of years that we've had to endure. I think about all of the unrest and the division and the strife that we have had to face in this life. I think peace is maybe somewhat of a lost concept You see, everybody wants to have peace in this life, don't they? Everybody wants to be able to be in that state of not worrying and not wondering and not wondering what's going on in life and and where all your maybe your safety or different things like that are going to come from. Everybody wants to have peace in this life. But brothers and sisters, where do you get that? Where do you get that grace and that peace that he talks about? Where can we find grace and peace? Well, brothers and sisters, he says it right here in this text through the knowledge of Almighty God. You want grace and you want peace, you find it in Almighty God. You want grace and you want peace. You look to God, you look to His Word, and you understand what God has done for us. When we study Almighty God, we cannot help but understand and think about what God has done for us. How He has given us everything that we need in this life. And we're going to look at that that idea here in just a moment. But it's so vital to look at Almighty God, to understand He's given us everything that we need in this life. Without our knowledge of Him, We won't understand who's providing us with grace. We won't understand who's providing us with peace. And you know, I think about this word knowledge. When when you whenever you study the Bible, it's interesting because when you think about the word knowledge, almost every single time in the New Testament, it is this Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. That's the Greek word that's used every time the word knowledge is used, except for here in this passage of scripture. In 2 Peter chapter, chapter 1, this word knowledge is actually the word epinosis. And it literally means coming to a full knowledge of knowing something. In fact, another definition was this. Knowledge toward an object that is ever maturing, yet never matured. When I think about that, you and I understand that the knowledge of God is something that is so important to have in our lives. It is something that we must continue to study in our lives. But you and I also know that when we study God, we will never ever know everything that there is to know about Almighty God, will we? God is so high and so holy. He is so far more than you and I are or that we could ever imagine to be. And yet it is something that we must always strive to study and to be students of so that we can better understand and better be appreciative of what He has done for us. That's the knowledge that we need to have. So I guess the question is this. We have the knowledge of God, right? We know that we can find the knowledge of God within the pages of the Bible. So, what do we do with it? What do we do with the knowledge that we have of Almighty God? Well, several things. That really one main idea. You and I know that we're commanded to go and teach, aren't we? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18-20, through 20, Jesus said, All authority is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But then He says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Mark 16, 15 through 16, Mark's uh, rendition of the Great Commission. He says that they are to go out and to teach all, all creatures and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 47, Luke's rendition of the Great Commission. Repentance, remission of sins must be preached in order for there to be salvation. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 4, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 8 here in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 8, the persecution of the Christians has arisen. It has gotten really, really bad for where they are. And so what do they do? They begin to spread out. But during all of that difficulty that they're facing, what are they doing? They're teaching and preaching the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, Paul tells Timothy, he says, I don't care what season it is. I don't care what's going on in your life. You be someone who is going to go and who is going to teach. So we understand that we're supposed to go and teach. But then I guess we could ask another question. What is it? that we're supposed to go and teach. What are you and I as individuals, as Christians, supposed to go out and preach? Go to Acts chapter 8. And I want to look at this passage here for just a moment. In Acts chapter 8, we understand there, actually at the end of chapter 7, 
Stephen has just been killed. Stephen has just been stoned. He's the first Christian martyr. And you roll into chapter 8. They are laying Stephen's things at the, feet of the, uh, at the feet of Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul. Saul would then go on to wreak havoc among the church. Thus, you get to verse 4, and the, and the gospel is having to be spread because people are being persecuted. They're running away from Saul. But while they're doing it, they're spreading the gospel. Well, you get to verse 5, and you're introduced to a man by the name of Philip. Philip is an interesting study, and we won't do that now, but Philip at this point in time, he's healing demon-possessed people. He is healing paralyzed people. He is healing the lame. He's doing all that he can, and with that, he's preaching and teaching the gospel, and people are believing him. But once you read about him, you then get introduced to a man by the name of Simon. Simon the sorcerer is what we generally call him. Now, Simon was someone who used to, at a later point in his life, was, or at an earlier point in his life rather, was someone who was dishonestly making his money by practicing and showing quote-unquote magic and sorcery. We understand that that's not real. He also knew that that wasn't real, and yet he was tricking people, and that's how he was making his money. And so here's Simon, and he, he's looking afar off, and he sees Philip. And he sees Philip teaching, or rather not teaching, but he sees Philip healing. And he says, how, how is he able to do those things? But I want you to notice what Philip is teaching to these people. I want you to go back to verse 5. I want you to notice verse 5 of Acts chapter 8. The Bible says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and did what? He preached Christ to them. Drop down to verse 12. Notice this. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And then you go into the very next verse that talks about how Simon himself also believed and was baptized. Philip understood that everything that the people needed was the preaching of Jesus Christ. They didn't need to hear the preaching of Philip. They didn't need to hear the preaching of, of his friends or whoever it might be. They needed to hear the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's all you and I need to be teaching. Whether it's from here in our classrooms, in our works, uh, in our schools, wherever it might be. The preaching of Jesus Christ is the only thing that we need to relay to other people. I want you to go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 3 with me. We'll try to quickly go through this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by glory and virtue. When I think about life and godliness, I first think about how God has created us physically. You know, you and I know that without God, we are literally nothing. It is from Him and through Him and because of His power that we are able to stand here and sit here where we do today. We are so intricately designed. I think about Psalm chapter 139, verse 13, where God writing about, or David rather, writing about God says that you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. And this is a verse that kind of hits home to me more so now because we have a child that's on the way. And I think about the fact that God has literally designed and intricately made her perfect in the way that she already is. He has already placed a soul within her. He has already designed her. He already knows who she is. That is something that is so mind-boggling to me. It is so beautiful to think about the power that God has and what He has done for you and I as individuals and as humans. And yet, not only is He our Creator, but God's also our sustainer, isn't He? He's the one who allows us to continue keeping on in this life, to succeed in this life. And the way that He does that is through His Word. The Bible is our roadmap, is it not? The Bible is our guide in this life to know how we must live and what we must do as we live and breathe in this life. Not only physically, but I think spiritually, most importantly. John chapter 6 and verse 68, the writer there says, Jesus you have the words of eternal life. There is no one else to whom we can go but Jesus Christ. John 11 and verse 25, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. There is no one else to whom you can go. John 14 and verse 6, you know the verse. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but through me. And yet, how do we do that? How do we gain access to that life? You and I know that we have to live a life full of godliness. That word godliness translates into the word devout. Someone who is God-like. So I guess the question for us is this. You want to be someone who's pleasing to God. How are you living your life? Are you living your life in such a way to where you are God-like? That when Jesus came to this earth and lived His life here and left us that example, we know that He's our example. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. And so with that being said, are we imitating Christ? Are we doing everything that we can to follow after Him and His pattern. Peter says, you want everything that pertains to life and godliness. We all want that, but brothers and sisters, how? 
How do you get all things that pertain unto life and godliness? He says again, it's quite simple. Through the knowledge of Him. I can't say it enough. If you want grace and peace, going back to verse 2, if you want life and godliness here in this verse right now, you find it through your knowledge of Almighty God. Everything that you and I could ever need in this life, it is found through Almighty God. In fact, I think about 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is talking to Timothy there, and in verse 15, he talks about the Scriptures. He says, these Scriptures that you have known from your childhood, they're going to make you wise concerning what? He says they're going to make you wise concerning salvation. But interestingly enough, where is that salvation found? Yes, it's through your faith, Timothy, but it's ultimately found where? In Christ Jesus. I don't know why that concept is something that is so difficult for our religious world to grasp. It is something that our religious world has bucked at over and over and over again, and yet for some reason, they don't want to listen to it. But it's so, so simple because we think about it. Salvation is found within Jesus Christ. We go look at Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. The church is the same as what? As Christ's body. How do you get into Christ's body? How do you get into the church? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. You're baptized into His body. It is so simple. You want salvation? You want to be in the church? You have to be baptized. And yet for some reason, our religious world bucks at it, which I guess brings up this question. Why are there so many different beliefs? Why are there so many different things that people want to believe when it comes to religion, but specifically salvation. I don't understand it. The only thing that I can think of is that it has to boil down to this idea of pride. Why else would anyone want to veer off and go away from what the Scriptures have told us if their, unless their life is not agreeing with the Bible? They don't like that, and so they want to go on and try to make a religion or a belief that suits them and fits them. Brother Clark talked about this in his Gospel meeting a couple of weeks ago. They think, oh, I'll just go create a different belief. I'll just go create a different religion, and it's got to be okay. I think about growing up, and this was probably the same for you. You grew up in your parents' household, and if you didn't like their rules, what did you do? You had to do them anyway. You had to follow them anyway, right? I guess you and I, we, I guess we could have left our house, and we could have tried to make it on our own and make our own rules, but that probably wouldn't work out. Well, the same thing is with us as Christians. A child understands that a father has his best needs and his best interests at heart, and that he has set boundaries and regulations for him. Brother, the same is with us and God. God has laid out his plan for us, rules, regulations that we have to follow. And if we don't follow those, then brothers and sisters, we're jeopardizing our soul. Very quickly, I want you to look at the last part of verse 4. Look at the last part of verse 4 as we conclude our study this morning. I want you to think about this word corruption. And if you would, go ahead and grab your Bibles. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 1. When I, when I think about the word corruption... I want you to think about this idea of decay. When I think about corruption, I want you to think with me about this idea of something that is decomposing, something that is gory, something that is nasty, something that you don't want to have anything to do with. But then when, I, when you think about the word corruption, I also want you to think about the word sin. Look at Isaiah chapter 1 with me here, beginning of verse 4. He says, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger. The Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds, look at this, and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. When I think about the word corruption, I think about the word sin. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing worse in this world. There is no other worse disease in this world than sin and what it does to you and I today. Sin is something that tears families apart. Sin is something that tears relationships apart. Sin is something that tears you apart as a Christian and it puts you in a not right standing with Almighty God. It separates us from Him. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. It is something that is horrible. It is something that is despicable. And it causes us so much hurt physically, spiritually, and emotionally. It is not worth it to get into sin. I think about 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. He talks about those three things there. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every single one of those is always present. 
whenever sin is something that comes into your midst. In fact, you go to Genesis chapter 3, you look at the very beginning of Eve in the garden with the serpent, Satan. Every single one of those things was present. I challenge you to go look at it this afternoon. Every single one of those things is present. You're probably thinking, well, Caleb, you can't stop there. You can't end it there. We have to look at something that's better, and you're right. There's a flip side to this coin. I want you to look at these precious promises. Those promises that he talks about there that is so beautiful for us to think about. Such a wonderful way for us to end our study. Such a wonderful way for us to be able to live our lives knowing that there is something better than the corruption that sin causes. In John chapter 14, Jesus gives us probably one of the most hope-filled passages in all of the Scriptures. Where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. And if I go, I will receive you unto myself, and where I am, there you may be also. What a beautiful promise that is for us as Christians. To know that Almighty God is there for us. That Jesus Christ, His Son, is there for us. That He's going to come again. He's going to receive us unto Himself. And what a way for us to be able to live our lives knowing that beautiful promise is still there. And that if we're faithful Christians, we're going to be able to receive them to Him. We're going to enjoy our reward. I hope that this study is something that you're looking forward to. We're going to continue on through the next eight Sunday mornings talking about these Christian graces. And I hope that this is something that is beneficial to you as Christians, as individuals who are living your lives for Almighty God. Maybe you're here this morning and you're someone who thinks, this hasn't really applied to me because I'm not a Christian, but I want it to. Well, you can change that this morning. We can baptize you into water, that water representation of the blood of Jesus, washing away your sins. You can go on your way rejoicing, knowing that you're on your way to heaven, adding in these Christian graces as you go through your life. But maybe you're here and you are a Christian, but maybe there's sin in your life. Maybe your life's not what it is meant to be. Maybe you've been uh, dealing with things in private. Know that you can take care of those with God yourself. But maybe you have a sin that people know about. You can come forward, repent of those things. We can pray for you. As we've talked about already, we are a family. We're going to do all that we can to encourage you, to lift you up, and to do our best, to put you in the best position possible for you. Or maybe you're here and you just need the encouragement of your brothers and sisters. Again, we're a family. We're going to do all that we can to help you, to strengthen you, to push you, and to make you the best that you can be for God. This is the only moment that you know that you have. If you need to be a Christian, make it now. If you need to come back to God, make that decision now. Let's stand and sing.